I'm talking with the composer Scott Walschlager, joined by the pianist Carl Larson. We're here to talk about their new album. It's called Dark Days. I've got it right here. Guys, you've seen that, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. congratulations <laughs> on the, uh, the album. Thank you. Um, Thank you. You guys are longtime collaborators. You've done recordings together before. Uh, Carl, maybe you want to give a quick shout out to uh, your Bowling Green State University uh, peeps because you're a grad of BGSU. I sure am, yeah. I, uh, I graduated, I, I got the, my doctorate in contemporary music there uh, in 2012. So uh, shockingly close ago. to my, uh, my 10 year reunion. <laughs> which is kind of crazy, but also, um, you know, given the current situation that we all find ourselves in, another funny little BG wrinkle, or not funny, but just kind of coincidental, is that's the last place that I really played live before wow. the pandemic came down. We played, Beethoven, my trio, played um, uh, at the Music at the Forefront series end of February 2020. Yeah. Well, we did an episode of uh, the Bowling Green radio series that we have syndicated on uh, Beethoven and on the music that you brought to uh, BG. So, well, we're here to talk about your music, Scott. And something, you know, as a listener, I would say your music is defined by a few different things, if it can be defined. That is, um, it is very intimate it requires a little bit of a commitment on the part of a listener to let themselves into this sound world of yours. There's also a level of unpredictability that runs throughout your work. And, but I have found in this album, reading the program notes, that there's sort of a framework that you can hang this on, and that is your experience with synesthesia. And I wonder if you can, first of all, tell folks who, who may not be familiar with the term what it is and how it relates to your own experience yeah um so yeah synesthesia is a, a neurological condition where you know basically you you kind of your senses get mixed up and so for me um with certain sound or certain kinds of music um there's an immediate kind of color association um and it's not even um it's such not a big deal to me, it's almost so normal just because it's, it, you know, it's just, I've lived with it my whole life. Um, but, you know, and then communicating it to other people, it's always a little bit like, you know, it's, it's hard for others to get a sense of what it would be like. But, um, you know, I use the sense of synesthesia to guide the harmonic structuring of the music. So basically it's kind of ends up being kind of a hyper intuitive way to construct your harmony. Um, where, you know, I'm using the sort of sense of consistency in the color or, you know, just being aware of the colors themselves kind of gives me guidance that's, uh, in some ways, it's extra musical. Um, and I, I, you know, when a listener hears the work, I don't expect them to actually hear, you know, the colors per se, but I do think they will hear a sense of, like you said, the word uh, sound world. And I think uh, the idea of each piece sort of being a world in itself um, is is guided by the synesthesia and then you know to speak to the kind of unpredictable aspect of the music I think that's part of the you know the the plan as well where you know you're creating these sound worlds that are unpredictable in a way and they're sort of encounters with something un, un, unforeseen but then you know once you get sort of familiar with the music I think it it's actually quite sits comfortably I think in a listener's ear but it is yeah an initial sort of encounter with it that's it is sort of different and strange and um you know but hope, hopefully welcoming because i think at the end of the day i'm trying to make something beautiful and welcoming for people to listen to yeah it, it's interesting that you use the term welcoming and i know carl you said this about the album itself we should mention it's a it's a series of shorts for piano piano solos that were written at, at different times but the title is dark days which you know it, can be interpreted as a little bit on the bleak side and it can be interpreted as relating to the pandemic and everything that's been going on over the past year but these pieces of music sort of predate all of that uh carl can you talk about your approach to creating this music and how you view it in terms of like what scott said there's a, a little bit of a hopeful sentiment to it a little bit of a warmthness to it as well yeah, I kind of think of um, these pieces as being, you know, you, you used, I think the first word you used to describe them was intimate. 
And I think that that's um, spot on. And I think that that has to do with like a lot of different factors. I think it has to do with the kind of the softness, like the kind of inviting nature of it, but also the fact that um, these pieces, um, listening to them to, to one degree, but I think especially playing them is, is almost like getting into Scott's um, head or, or kind of emotional center. It's like, we've often talked about how this is kind of like reading a journal mm. or, you know, like I think in the liner notes, I talk about how it's like, um, you know, like, um, like a Frank O'Hara poem where it's just like a little note written, you know, is it, it's not something to be, you know, sung from the mountaintops. It's something that you leave, uh, you leave a little note for, for somebody that you love, like next to the refrigerator or something like that. Mm. Um, it has that very personal quality. And I think, um, it's really nice for it to live on this album now because in, in some ways the like experiencing it on an album is a one-to-one -one experience it's the listener and me or it's me and scott or it's the listener and scott it's kind of this direct line versus playing it in a concert which is a different um mm. emotion and a different sound um and the way that i approach them i think is just you know at this at this point um basically uh intuitive um, both just because of the kind of shared backgrounds that Scott and I have and kind of aesthetic preferences that we both happen to have, but also just the fact that we've been working together for almost 10 years um, on some of these pieces, on larger projects, on, on things with bigger forces instrumentally. Um, so it's kind of, it, it fits like a glove for me, I think. Yeah. How cognizant are you, Carl, when you're preparing these works of things like Scott's synesthesia, his rhythm, his musical language? I mean, how cognizant are you of the nuts and bolts when you create a performance like this and put it on the paper? Or do you find that your intuition sort of guides you? Um, I am very aware of some of those elements and other elements I don't think about at all. Yeah. Um, the synesthesia for one thing is not something that really, um, it's not something that I experience, um, personally in my life. And it's, it's not something I think that's necessary to understand as you learn the music so much. Um, I think it's more interesting just to think about, you know, how, how these sound worlds were created in relationship to this, to this very kind of specific condition and experience that Scott has is, is very interesting, but I don't think it necessarily changes the way that I play it. It certainly changes the way that I hear it. Um, but I definitely do think a lot about um, kind of the philosophy that is behind a lot of the music. A lot of Scott's music has to do with kind of uh, like the like the end of the world or kind of like the experience of the world ending or something like that and that sounds like very apocalyptic obviously but it's not necessarily what that what that means like there's a for example there's a piano concerto that uh he wrote for me a couple of years ago called meditation on dust that you know the prompt is kind of what if a strauss tone poem was left in the desert for ten thousand years you know it has this kind of timeless quality and it treats sound and music like a physical object and like can can um that can experience the effects of the natural world and things like that so i think about that a lot i think about the negative space i think about the notes that you know maybe were there and and now are not there um kind of from more of a heady philosophical way and i think that that kind of helps um set the um the overall atmosphere because the, the music is so atmospheric it's not yeah. it's not necessarily like you know, it's, it's not a Mozart sonata. Right. It's a different type of listening. Well, yeah. I, looking at the little snippets of score that you have in the in the program book, and then listening to your interpretation of it, there there is such, there has to be a lot that's going on between the notes on the page and, and the notes that you're bringing to the piano, because there's such a wide range of color. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Scott, the way Carl's talking about it, I have like visions of you waking up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night thinking of Strauss in the desert, you know, <laughs> these, these really interesting ideas that have given rise to your music within your, you know, your, your musical language that we talked about. 
Why don't we talk about the provenance of some of these pieces? The title track is called Dark Days, mm -hmm. and you wrote this in 2017. Can you tell us where that came from? Yeah. So, um, and just like, you know, the, the title being Dark Days, I think it's nice also that in Carl's liner note, he sort of expands the uh, the definition to also meaning like the, the days of winter when you're sort of cozy by a fire and you know so the dark days aren't necessarily psychologically dark it's just maybe when there's less light and you're in a more kind of intimate you know cave as it were um and uh, but yeah so the title of the peace dark days definitely is in reference to the more psychological dark days um and you know, in some way, I you know this this comes up a lot now that we have the album coming out. But I think we've been in the dark days for a while. Like I don't, I don't think they just started or something. You know, so I think, you know, I think we're in the dark days. Um, and but you know, the the peace dark days came from um, 2017. Uh, it was the inauguration was on television, and I kind of shut I shut everything off. I did a major like I'm not going to answer my phone. I'm not going to the internet. All this stuff because I just didn't want to deal with it. And so I sat down to, I was just writing a piece and the piece that I ended up writing was, it, I called it Dark Days because um, as I was putting the double bar line on the piece, I noticed that the piece was composed like during the transition of power. And something about that just felt like a kind of tidal wave of like feeling, you know, history pass through your body or something. And so, I said that, you know, I was like, I was like, what's the title of this piece? And I, I said, well, um, dark days, you know, because we're in the dark days now, still, yeah. you know. So, you know, so it came from that. But, but again, the title is always sort of a poetic afterthought on some level, too, because I'd hope somebody could just listen to it and not even necessarily know what, it, what, what the story behind it, you know. Right. Um, so let's also talk about some of the other tracks on this recording. I mean, folks can really dive into the the rich inspiration and techniques that you, you bring to this music, Scott, when they read the program notes and just listening to it as well kind of draws you in. Um, you know, you have to commit yourself to, to listening to this music, but the performance and the notes itself, it, it's a really um, distinct musical language that you have. Um, let's talk about some of the other works here. I notice you've got three tracks which are entitled Brontal, uh, Brontal mm -hmm. number two, number six, number 11. That mm -hmm. is um, a term that, that came up, I think, on Soft Aberration, one of your prior albums. Yep. And it's, it's a made up word, right? What, what does yes. that mean? It's a completely made up word. Um, I have to give credit to Kevin Sims, who's another long term um, uh, collaborator, he percussionist, and we were roommates back almost 20 years ago in New York City, and um, he did a series of uh, drawings with, um, on, with crayon on orange paper, and he said, I think this is Brontal, meaning at that time that di a dinosaur would have made it, so Brontosaurus, it was sort of an adjectival form of Brontos uh, Brontosaurus, but then it came to sort of become a philosophical concept for me completely made up. But again, I do think the role of the artist is to make things up, you know, so it's like, I'm not pretending it's a scientific term or something. Um, but so that so it's come to mean to me, I guess, um, the pairing of or sort of the embracing of or affirmation of opposites, uh, and, and kind of extreme contrast. And I think the Bronto philosophy sort of gets some of its energy from you know New York City, where when you're in the city, you can experience two um, very different realities at the same time. So you can be passing by the most abject thing you've seen in a while next to the most beautiful thing you may be seen in a while. And these two experiences, I don't think are necessarily um, one's better than the other. It's that they both exist in the same space. And as people, we're encountering these contradictions all the time. And so in a sense, I think the Brontal philosophy is actually a real common philosophy because the experience of you know, driving through you know, a strip mall or something, but listening to Bach would be sort of Brontal, you know? Yeah. And I think you know, in some way it's a, maybe a very American concept too, because you know, we don't have the Mona Lisa, but you know, we, have, uh, we do have strip malls that are, you know, and, and, we, and we have our, our, our Bach too, in a sense. So I think, um, yeah, so I guess in some way it's a poetic term that I then use when I have pieces that are built on a more kind of collage based uh, pieces. So the Brontos on the album 
are they're sort of they're more fragmentary they're more episodic i think they're a little bit more uh shocking a lot more contrasts maybe in the brontos um and yeah so that's sort of the, the short history of bronco yeah well i can identify because i guarantee you that i've driven through strip malls playing bach and exactly right and that is that is bronto yeah yeah that, that resonates as I've well driven yeah. through, i've driven through strip malls listening to you Play on the radio. <laughs> I don't think I can beat that. That's about yeah. as meta as we can get yeah. right now. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you put this program together because you have these different pieces here, uh, 10 different pieces, right? All composed at different times between uh, 2007 and 2017. And they're obviously listed out of order. What was the idea behind uh, how you put them together to create this album. Yeah, well, it came together kind of slowly over time from working you know, a lot with Carl. And, you know, um, Carl had put together a recital of actually all my piano music a few years ago. And at that time we had decided, okay, let's start recording these pieces uh, and then see, you know, down the road, how maybe we make an album or something. Um, and I think what happened with this is that, you know, with the pandemic, uh, and us sort of being in this different kind of lockdown mode, um, I was like, well, what kind of, you know, we were already kind of talking about what kind of album we wanted to make. And and to me, I was like, you know, I, I think I want to make, pick kind of the most introspective pieces and make sort of a arc from the pieces that would, so you could actually listen to the album from start to finish as if it was sort of like a novel or, you know, sort of a an afternoon in this other world or whatever. And actually it took quite a bit of time because, you know, I have a lot of piano pieces and I'm shuffling around, you know, we have a lot more that we've recorded, not just the ones on the album. So there's a lot of trial and error just to get the right like flow of it. And um, I, Carl was super helpful with that too. And I don't know, Carl, if you want to say anything about the, how we put together the tracks. Yeah, it was, I mean, you know, some of them, some of them make more sense going into one another than others, you know, to me, it always made sense to put the Brontals together and the secret machines together. Um, right. But I think that it does have a really nice arc, the way that we kind of finally settled on it. There's a lot of trial and error and a lot of shuffling around and, yeah. you know, a, a overly obsessive, like, oh my gosh, where are we going to put this one? But um, <laughs> I think I think that the, the shape of it now is really nice. And this was actually kind of pointed out to me. It, it's not something that I intended, but it was pointed out to me recently that it starts, you know, with dark days, and the the piece "Dark Days" is um, pretty pretty moody and pretty pretty dark. I would say it's it's not a it's not like a bright object. It's, it's pretty rich and pretty dark. And um, as you go through the trajectory of the album, it ends with these really bright, kind of brilliant, beautiful pieces in in contrast to "Dark Days." So yeah. I kind of I appreciate how that's kind of happened. I think that that was probably, um, you know, not, it was subliminal maybe for us, but I really like the way that that all kind of existed. Right. And and now I've been, I've been, you know, hard at work practicing this music um, for, we have a, a concert next week and it's been really lovely to kind of play it as though it were just one big hour long piece. Yeah, which is really fun, and I, I'm finding that it works really well in that setting too. Uh, the concert you mentioned that that's happening uh, at uh, Roulette in Brooklyn, right? Yep. Yeah, that's going to be streamed online. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, it'll be streamed so, online, and it's actually a live audience too. It's one of the first concerts that has a limited live live audience. I think it's already sold out, which is okay. awesome. But um, so it's the first time. It's the first time in it, and you know since you know, whenever, a year and a half ago that we've had a live concert. So I think for you too, Carl, right? This is the first. Yeah, I mean, the last one, like I said, last one was in Bowling, or, oh, technically that's not true because we played the same, we played the same concert in New York when we got back, but the, that concert tour with Barry Tubman was the last one, yeah. February 2020. We'll just right. say it was Bowling Green. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. I like yeah, how I, the, um, I like how the whole piece, uh, how the whole album is put together and you talk about it in terms of a recital. You know, you're, you're kind of setting up from one piece to the next. You're beginning with Dark Days, which kind of lulls you into one level of listening. And by the time you get to the end and Secret Machine number six, 
that sounds like the most bright, optimistic, happy piece of music, you know, to, to end it with. So there, there is, I think, a, a conscious uh, entity at work there in the way that you've constructed this program. Um, mm -hmm. So folks can still stream it, even if they can't get in to see this concert, yes. right? Yeah, yeah it's, exactly. Um, Thursday, May 6th at 8 o'clock p.m. at Brooklyn's Roulette. We'll put a link to that uh, okay. when we publish this, uh, this conversation. Uh, Carl, can you talk a little bit about your collaboration uh, experience with Scott? How that's changed over the years? You guys have been doing this for 10 years now. Mm -hmm. um, what have you learned from working with Scott about playing the piano and interpreting music? I think... That's a great question. Like that's, that's like a book, I think, right there. <laughs> um, so Scott and I, it hasn't been quite 10 years, but I think it's probably pushing, pushing eight or nine at this mm -hmm. point. And when we uh, met, we were actually introduced to one, in, one another by our mutual friend, Chris Arone, um, who knew that Scott was um, kind of looking for a pianist to write this piano concerto for and knew that I, played a lot of music that is kind of similar to his um, pretty well and, and was really into it. And when I, when we met, I had just moved to New York, not, not that, not that much, much before. And what that kind of signified for me in my life, just moving to New York was kind of the end of uh, an academic existence. Like I was ABD at Bowling Green. I was, I was making an active decision to, instead of, seeking out um, a, an academic job, um, which, you know, is usually what you do when you finish a doctorate. I decided that I was going to go to New York and try to participate in, in, in what I considered to kind of be the heart of um, contemporary music in the U.S. It's just kind of where, you know, a lot of things crawl out of the ooze here and then are proliferated around. So to get hooked up with Scott at that point in my life, I think was very important and kind of freeing for me. It's a very different way to play music. And um, it, was a, it was a collaborative experience like I hadn't experienced with other composers in that, you know, we both, one, agreed like, okay, this is gonna be something that we kind of do together pretty intensely for a while. And like, I don't think either of us at the beginning thought like, oh, 10 years from now, we're gonna be putting out this album and stuff, but you know, I, I was committed to learning this concerto and I was uh, going to learn all of his solo piano music that he sent me to kind of get the language in my brain. And we would just start rehearsing kind of regularly. I would learn a piece, he would come listen to me play it, he would kind of coach me through it. And it was a very two way street, you know, I, even though these, some of these pieces were already probably like seven, eight years old, there was still like a, like say, oh, I could do this or I could do this. And you know, there would, that would be welcome, even though it's like, oh, this is published. It's like, no, we can still kind of move stuff around. And that was really revealing um, to me just as the process. And then when you ask what I learned about playing the piano from this, this whole thing is, um, Scott is like secretly a pretty good pianist. He doesn't- he Not true, to... not true. <laughs> yeah. That was my next question. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Emily, Emily, Scott's wife says he interacts with the piano, which is, Excellent. That, that's but both as yeah. a composer and as a performer. Yes. And just a, like a human. Yeah. Um, but there are, there are some elements of, of Scott's language that, uh, as far as like playing the piano, kind of prompt you to do things that maybe you wouldn't necessarily do, especially if you're just coming out of a conservatory environment where you're, you're have really polished everything. And, you know, you can play that, you can play the things perfectly, but, you know, learning to embrace kind of like the something that's a little more gross or something that's a little brash or um embracing a virtuosity that is um just the antithesis of maybe what you can find in a lot of contemporary music you know living in that single note living in that measure that's you know 45 seconds long that sort of thing mm -hmm. um so a, a kind of a patience and a broadening of, of a sound palette. Hmm. That, that wasn't a book. It was just a little novella, basically. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's um, <laughs> the cliff notes. Yeah. Scott, before I let you guys go, um, 
maybe turn the question around a little bit. You've been working with Carl for these past uh, eight years, I guess. Uh, how has that collaboration affected your uh, composing? Yeah, well, I think one, um, you know, you know, Carl, Carl's given me a lot of license to literally just develop whatever artistic path, you know, I, I'm on um, with, with him basically being very accepting of, you know, <laughs> some, you know, things that probably don't work and some things that super work. And I think in some way, so there's this, um, you know, this feeling of like freedom when I work with Carl, artistic freedom, that he's one of these, you know, rare people you find as an artist who is just a hundred percent behind you um, in a way that is, you know, that that's just unusual, you know, and I know Carl has his own, you know, tastes and opinions that are, are different than mine in a lot of ways, but it's, he, I know he approaches my work with such a level of like respect that, you know, I guess I feel in some way that I'm allowed to fail with Carl and that allows me to succeed. Um, and I think, you know, also Carl's, um, an amazing musician. And so I feel it's allowed me to actually get way more exact in some of the compositional notation in this, in these sort of things. And, um, you know, Carl's capacity for abstract ideas with music is, is very impressive. And I think actually a rare, you know, feature, because I think um, musicians can be kind of square with their thinking of, you know, concepts of, of you know time and sound and all this and Carl's very um open-minded so I think in some way it's just allowed me to have the freedom to write what I want when I'm working with him and uh and I'm also I can go into the most kind of you know abstract creative language with him and it's um met with welcome you know ears and uh he's it's it's just it's fruitful in that way and uh you know I think hopefully we just keep making more albums and in some way you know like i i uh i don't need to now become a good pianist because i have carl so you know like <laughs> I, I don't i definitely don't have to practice ever again and um but uh yeah it's just you know it's i'm really lucky that i've been able to have this you know collaboration with him so um you know hopefully we just keep doing what we're doing because so far so good everything we've put out has been we're, we're so proud of it and it just sounds great so yeah oh, wonderful virtual hug <laughs> <laughs> There's the album, it's called Dark Days, out now from New Focus Recordings. Uh, what's that cover art? I like the cover art on the album. Oh yeah, so that is a painting by uh, a friend of mine in Erie, Pennsylvania named Teresa Musato. Uh, and Teresa is a wonderful painter, old school, you know, uses actual paint, thick layers of paint. Uh, and her paintings are so emotional when you see, when you see them. I think it is definitely the moodiness is captured in the, in the, the album art here, but, um, seeing her paintings will make me almost want to cry sometimes because of just the amount of emotion she puts into the, the actual color, you know, and it's abstract art. There's no, any, there's no representation to what she's drawing. And it's just that immediate emotional, you know, impact of the, the color in her painting. Uh, yeah. So Teresa Musato, she's on Instagram and hopefully she, her, she gets famous and rich and, and, you know, whatever, but she lives in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is my hometown. So I feel in some way she too was connected to the Bronto spirit. Well, that's great. So if folks want to get the whole painting, or at least this much of it, they have to go for the CD, the physical right. CD. You can also get this as a, a digital download from all the usual suspects. We'll link to that on our website. Also, uh, pianist Carl Larson performing at Brooklyn's Roulette on Thursday, May 6th at 8 o'clock p.m. That'll be streamed. It'll be streamed live. Yeah. Live stream. Yeah. Are, are they going to archive it? Do you know? Yeah, we'll be archi archived okay. as well. So we'll, we'll find a link that we can put to that and uh, people can go watch it. Composer Scott Wolschlager, pianist Carl Larson, congrats on the new album. Thanks so much for uh, talking with us today here on FM 91. Thank you. Thank you.